Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you wherever you are, good afternoon, good evening in our one world. This is a World Academy of Arts and Science event in union with the United Nations Geneva office, focusing on, for this panel, civil society and youth, new strategies for transformative impact. Thomas Reuter, professor from the Melbourne University and trustee of the World Academy of Arts and Science together with myself, Obiora Ike, we are part of the co conveners for this event. I will make a very short speech just to introduce um, the event. I will also ask Thomas to make some short speech concerning the rules and the regulations, and then we will go into the activity. But generally, the world, as we know, is changing. It has always been changing. But we are in the 21st century. The 21st century means that we have centuries before us, and we should have advanced with the means of communication, of technology, of knowledge, and of the resources and assets of people of this age. We are a lucky group of human beings with 7 billion plus existing on the planet. We have so many chances and so many good opportunities to make the world a better place. It is our work. It is our chance. So we are focusing on civil society and youth and how they will be impactful in transforming society. And we know the problems we know the issues, we know the conditions. Today's panel and the great panelists, great people selected for this, will focus more on strategies for solutions. So we are not discussing problems, there are many of them. <clears throat> I would like to <clears throat> make you know in this introduction that we have identified, of course, 12 strategies for civil society organizations and youth towards change and social transformation. These 12 strategies will be part of the questions um, the, my colleague, uh, Professor Thomas Reuter, will be posing to the panelists when we come to the questions. But essentially, they involve, and I will say them very shortly, how we develop internal democratic processes, how we interoperate in our diversity, that's number two, how we bridge gaps between global and local concerns, how global CSOs can support local CSOs. The next might be how to orientate online campaigns from, from practice, from theory to practice, and how we can put pressure on people, including using peace, how the media can be of help in terms of publicizing local efforts. Those 12 strategies include also building partnerships with academic actors, and also with media and finance corporates and states. It involves creating private fund for SDGs, strengthening economic narratives in the green economy, and finally, how we can unite CSOs to convince the public that transformation is possible. These are the areas where big research ahead of this conference have happened. The conference is being celebrated 75 years of the United Nations this year, 1945 to 2020. 60 years of the World Academy of Arts and Science, 1960 to year 2020. It is a world yearning for transformation. It is a world in a COVID pandemic era, and we know the consequences. That's why we welcome you, Gareth Presh, as a panelist. You are founder and CEO of the World Health Innovation Summit. You are a great gentleman with potential to transform. We are happy to have you. Welcome. Thanks, Obi. We, we welcome Beno, Beno Verlen. You are UNESCO Chair for Global Understanding for Sustainability. Beno, your writings and your activities are globally acknowledged. Thank you for being here, and we are going to learn a lot from you. We welcome Nadia Balgobin, the young, brilliant, ebullient woman, Senior Associate of Globeethics.net member of the pool of experts, member of sustainability goals around the UN activities, and um, 
my consultant on many levels. Thank you for being here, Nadia. Thank you, Aviora. Cyril Ritchie, uh, we want to thank you for accepting the invitation. You are the first vice president of Conga. Um, you, your works are globally acknowledged, and we are happy to say welcome to this panel. And Thomas will be asking questions to each of the panelists. Finally, last but not least, Tagildin Hamad, the Secretary General of Wango, the Vice President of UPF International. We are really delighted to have you join in the discussions. I will now ask Thomas to give us the ground rules and then to go ahead with asking question panelists questions. Towards the mm -hmm. end, we have one and a half hours for this entire thing. We have a large audience of listeners and participants. Mm -hmm. We will give you a chance to make questions. Thomas will tell you how much you may speak in terms of time. We have to manage it well. We need participation. We need global broad and we need action following. That's what CSOs are known. Uh, Thomas, I hand okay. over now to you. Uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, for those of you who have joined the second <laughs> panel and didn't join the first panel, there is at the top of the chat history, you will find a link to the participant list where you can leave your name and contact because we are growing a working group and we are open to new members and supporters and contributors. So please, to facilitate that, leave your contact. Um, panelists, please keep your uh, responses under two minutes if you, if you can, though we, we will be flexible. Uh, that means you may be a little bit, take a bit more time on, on some questions and a bit less on others, but that's the general aim. And the reason is that we would like to have plenty of time for questions from, from other participants. And uh, I, I will be fielding those questions, but I would like to ask Oviora to ask uh, the uh, questions to the panelists and then I will be uh, which is what I did in the last session, and I will just be feeling the questions from the floor at the end. Okay. Obiora, you're still muted. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, with the ground rules known, um, Garrett Presh, you will be the first to receive the question. And it is simple. What is your perspective on the 12 strategies identified by the working group so far? And have you had any practical experiences with any of them? Yeah, I, I think all these strategies come down to why. And from my perspective, I have to kind of talk about my two young girls um, because it's about the future. Uh, what type of society do we want? Um, from my perspective, I look at it, I have two young girls, there's you know, four and seven. and Really, we have to develop strategies that are, that are inclusive, but also from the planet's perspective, what sort of future do we want to leave for, for, for the next generation and for the generations after? Mm -hmm. So my perspective about our strategy going forward is how do we involve and engage the next generation? And these are questions that we all have to kind of try and answer. And how do we actually bring these solutions as in from a financial perspective, as, a, as in creating value? And then how do we, um, you know, execute them as a group collectively? Um, I look at the current leadership, you know, that we, that we have and, 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 and our responsibility and that, that's on our shoulders. Um, we need to make sure that we make decisions now post-COVID that brings us forward. And Obiori, you spoke about, you know, the progression of society. We have to ask the hard questions. Are we progressing as a society? Are we learning lessons? If we look at the COVID situation, I think it gives us a prime example of that we really haven't learned um, because we have been forewarned about pandemics. It's the same with the climate change situation. And if we look at the strategy there, we are being forewarned. Um, so how do we enable people to make those decisions? I think there's a, there's a bridge to be made, a knowledge transfer, there's a gap there. Um, local society need to be able to feel, feel comfortable. We have to build trust. We have to be open. We have to be transparent. Um, so how do we do that? Um, I mean, part of our work with the SDGs, it's very important that, we, that we're open, we're transparent, 
and that we show, um, shall we say, communication that, that, that brings all those tools to enable people. I think we have to go out and meet the people as well. And I hope that uh, us as a group here can start that conversation and build that trust. Thank you very much, Gareth. Very, very much. You just kept to time. And that example will be a model for the panelists. <laughs> Um, the key thing is transgenerational. And I ask the same question now to um, um, Nadia Balgobin. Would you want to identify what you consider your perspective on these 12 strategies and identify um, your practical experiences of any of them? First of all, good afternoon to everyone. And thank you, Tomas, for the opportunity. And to you also, Professor A.K., for enabling me to contribute to this a uh, great initiative. I was very happy to read those 12 strategies. Most of them reflect either my reflections around how we can improve on CSAs or CSOs and the youth, or reflection that I had, but that needs to be implemented at a point in time. So um, coming to what needs to be, to be done uh, in terms of the way forward, I think the multi-stakeholder approach is something that even last time I was in it, uh, early this year, I went to an event at the UN and this came again, multi-stakeholder, and everybody was just looking at themselves and saying, how come that we are still strengthening multi-stakeholder collaboration while we know for decades we've been talking about this. So multi-stakeholder approach, I think, is comes at least from experience made, that when it is well uh, driven, particularly at a country level, having made the experience with a country in a sector, we can see that public sector can come on board, private sector can come on board, CSOs can come on board. And if we reach out to academia, we can even enhance the opportunity for achieving good results. Thank you very much, Nadia. Multi-stakeholder is a very key word. Some even use the word multilateralism. You brought us into the picture. I would like to address the question to Beno. I mean, Beno, what's your most promising strategy? You look at the 12 of them there outlined. Which one will you take as the most promising strategy in view of the discussions we are holding? Yeah, hello to everybody also from my side. Um, uh, for me, number three is the core topic I think bridging the gap between the global goals and local action. I think many of the international programs have a top-down structure. So it's rather from experts or some international bodies that they are designing some strategy and then they try places on the planet uh, very often independent of local or regional cultures and very often independent of specific historical conditions of different places and with uh, the people living there. So for me, for the future, it's very important that people are not forced to, to do certain things, uh, but that they are more engaging deliberately. And for that, I think it's very important that people can understand their own local life in a global perspective so that they know what their ways of acting has, what kind of implications for the global constellation. And with that, the most important thing then is to strengthen the bottom up movements and convincing people uh, to change their life uh, ways of living and hopeful, hopefully also to show them the benefit they have if they change their uh, ways of living for their own uh, life, but also especially what the first speaker was mentioning, Garrett, for future generations. Um, and I think that's the important point that people engage with, uh, with a self-responsibility, but also, as I put it, also a gain of uh, pleasure and experiencing directly the benefits of ch changing their lives in a more sustainable way and a more healthy way. That's from my 
view, my point of view, the, the most important uh, things that we need to address, how to engage people living in certain localities, certain regions for global issues. And for that, they need to have a global understanding of their own living conditions. You know, I, mean, I would like to come back to you again on this because you've struck a word with freedom, the ability of people to choose and to do things on their own. We know the difficulty, of course, that people will never do it. They need to be led in many cases. And it will be important to engage you in another question. How do you think that this strengthening of the bottoms up approach would help the self-responsibility, which has always lacked? And that's why CSLs exist. Um, allow me to go to Cyril. Cyril, welcome to this program. And you look at those 12 um, strategic um, uh, strategies. And what, what, what strikes you? Which ones strike you? All of them together, particular ones. Let's share your wisdom. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, partly because uh, the main NGO and CSOs that I'm involved with are heavily oriented towards the United Nations, I want to bring that in as an element, a fundamental element. Uh, remember that the UN Charter is one of the most wonderful documents that there is. The unfortunate part is that the governments which signed up to it uh, do not follow their commitments. Uh, we have so many examples of uh, governments acting contrary to the, to the Charter Whereas the Charter is, as you said this morning, uh, Ubiora, a values-based document. Uh, it's a document that sets out aspira <coughs> aspirations for humanity that we in civil society are far more faithful in implementing than very many governments. And indeed, uh, if the Charter were followed, we would be on a significantly better path uh, towards the future which is why uh, in my world, uh, the fact that the UN has got as far as agreeing on the sustainable development goals is a major step forward. I have to interject that I was a little surprised uh, to hear this morning one of the affirmative speakers say, we haven't sat down and looked at the future. I think we've been sitting down for centuries and particularly the last decades, looking at the future through the UN and through major civil society organizations, and we need far more of it, far more neutral and values-based uh, approach. Um, uh, to me, the um, uh, strategies, I have a link between strategies two, three, four, and seven that I want to give an example of simply from my experience within the uh, Conference of UN NGOs Congo. We have as two examples just to show what can be done. We have set up a database of more than 500 Asia-Pacific civil society organizations, national, local, regional, and so forth. And our purpose is to enable them to have greater understanding of the UN system and greater access to it, and that their experience in implementing the SDGs at the national, regional, local level is brought forward so that other NGOs and other CSOs and governments can learn that we do deliver on the ground. We deliver to communities, we deliver to villages, and that that's what governments need to be, need to be doing. Uh, we need far more commitment uh, from the governments. One other comment on a different strategy. Uh, number eight uh, was particularly referred to this in this morning's session about creating partnerships with academic actors. And there again, I think we should use what we have we don't always need to reinvent the wheel, although we're extremely good at that, all of us. Uh, but the United Nations, Academ United Nations academic impact is one channel for enabling us all to work better with uh, global, uh, with, with uh, academic actors. There are two elements that seem to me to be uh, partly missing. One is what we do in face of the massive repression by governments of civil society in so many countries, what we call the shrinking civil society space. And uh, Civicus has documented over a hundred different countries where these are. Um, what we need there 
I hope we would get is the more democratic governments speaking up much more loudly and forcefully in intergovernmental bodies to help defend this shrink, uh, defend us against this uh, shrinking of the space. We need to work far more together with those who are we those who are friendly, shall we say, towards the concept of civil society, which is after all already written in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenants. And we need to mobilize or strengthen our links with parliamentarians who themselves should be controlling the governments that speak at the UN. There are some first thoughts. Thanks, Oviora. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cyril. And just because you bring us back to the United Nations, the SDGs, behind all these are values which drive society. And we will be coming to that in a, another session. But I would like just to call Tagildin Hamid, if you are present, and you are, would you want to give us your own perspective of which of these um, 12 strategies that have been worked out you would like to identify particularly? You can unmute yourself, Hamad. Uh, sir, I'm afraid uh, Hamid hasn't joined the meeting yet. Okay, so we, we have taken note of, thank you very much, um, admin, Administrator of WAS. We would um, go back now to Gareth. Um, what future do we live for the next generation? We need to hear your insights. What, um, what would be your insights into this kind of future which you generate? You mentioned them already somehow in terms of transgenerational in terms of listening, in terms of, but you said something that human beings are forewarned, pandemics are forewarned, and yet people do nothing. They just keep on marking time until it um, implodes on them. So what would be your insights of going beyond this? Are we progressing? That was your question. Are we? What are your insights? And the same will go to Nadia and the rest of the panelists who are present now. Yeah, I have to be quite honest, I'm full of optimism in this space. And uh, I'll tell you why. You just have to look at what's happening worldwide um, in terms of youth engagement and the passion and the vision that they have. And they do have the values. I think that's what we can see because they're willing to take action and they're willing to uh, let their voice be heard. Um, you know, we have wisdom and we have knowledge and that's what we should be sharing. Um, we have a responsibility to share that knowledge and to share that wisdom. And I think as Cyril has mentioned and other colleagues, you know, we have that opportunity. Um, the 17 SDGs give us a roadmap. The UN Charter as well. I think these are sort of um, documents and publications that need to be articulated wider into a local concept, like from a local perspective, because we have to begin to engage people and to notify people that they're actually out there because I'm pretty sure that most people um, are probably not aware of these documentations or of these publications and we need to access, we need to, we need to kind of share that knowledge out there, use the platforms that we have, use UN Academic, for example. Um, we have the 25 plus 5 uh, leadership platform as well, where we're engaging with the cities and the mayors. So I think we have plenty of opportunity and digital, of course. I mean, this session being streamed, we're all over the world. We're able to contribute. Um, what a fantastic opportunity social media has given us. You know, Facebook and others, they do have their, you know, they do have their, shall we say, their negative side, but they have a lot of positives. So let's use those as communication tools. Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, you bring actually this fresh insight. You, you seem to be an optimistic person. Many are not. Nadia, are you optimistic? What are your experiences and what fresh insights do you bring into this conversation in terms of CSO activity and engagement? Well, I'm also very optimistic, to be honest, because I have a son. He's 14. And I'm happy to see that those youth have a very different perspective of the, of the world, even though they have been the one who have gone every Friday outside on the street to say what they feel we should be addressing in terms of environment. But 
outside of this, I think they are, they don't have probably the, the wrong, um, uh, I would say heritage we have because they, they grew up with this technological world and then they, they are aware also of how to address probably uh, a lot of those problems. And I've seen so many of them really engage in various sectors, uh, maybe engineering, maybe it innovation, maybe it health. So from the, this, at least from this part of the world, I would say I am optimistic because they have more or less the environment that can enable them probably to achieve their goals. But when I, when I do and look at the work we do together, um, Professor Ike in the field of ethics in higher education, and each time we go in a country and we go into the universities and when we meet with the youth, I've been approached so many times by those youth who have also their projects, but they are not given the opportunity to either uh, leave them or to, um, implement them or to develop them to get the right support. Therefore, I think that the youth today, maybe it in the North or in the South, there's no difference. They are very sensitive. They are very open. They have ideas, but they need to get the right space for them to contribute. And if I have to link the youth to the civil society organization, I would encourage civil society organization to bring as much as they can the youth through internship so that they can benefit from the learning of the work of CSOs so that also at the same time, they bring professionalism that sometimes CSOs also lack in terms of you know, either technology or in some areas maybe it in finance, maybe it um, in communication, all kind of aspects that sometimes because NGOs are also in a survival mode, they are also always struggling. Uh, sometimes we wonder whether they can really achieve their goals, if not being in a survival mode. So I would encourage CSOs to link up strongly with academia and with the, with the youth, and not only as the companies are doing, CSOs have also to take the, the youth in their organization for internships so that they can learn both from each other. Thank you very much. Um, Beno, you are UNESCO Chair for Global Understanding for Sustainability, and this is a great responsibility. We know the role UNESCO plays in terms of not just UN activity, but in terms of education. What fresh insights um, will you bring into this conversation? In, in the view of civil society and youth engagement. Yeah, if you're looking at um, Fridays for Future and, and uh, movements like that, but also a lot of young people, how they are engaged for a certain moment in their life, but very often they lose interest and walk out again. And I think it has very much to do with um, our schooling systems and educational systems. Um, the specialization in disciplines, all schools, biggest part of the world are still linked to the mastering of problem constellation at the 19th century in, 19th century in Europe, more or less, and the developments of, of science in different disciplines. So I think what we need to do is to, and if you really want to have the engagement of young people in different local parts of the world, we also need to change the schooling system in that respect that we are going more into transdisciplinary topics, that we are not educating people to choose the right discipline for the later career, but to engage with the schooling knowledge in their everyday life. That means that we should at least strengthen the parts of transdisciplinary engagement, that means problem-oriented engagement in schools, and tell them how they can use the different stock of knowledge that it does at disposition in sciences for the solution of certain problems, but not in the categories of the disciplinary division of labor of universities and the schooling system. So I think if you really want to have a strong engagement 
for, of young people for global problems in local action settings, then we need to show them how they can make use of their knowledge to solve solutions they are confronted with. And this cannot be the disciplinary ordering of competences. This must be a transdisciplinary competence. And I'm quite sure, and I'm still very optimistic that we can achieve that to show people how young people how they can use the knowledge they can acquire through all forms schooling system and beyond for their engagement solution of of, um, of uh, problems they are confronted every day and then also showing the impact uh, let them see the impact of their actions and how much they it matters that they are engaging that is not staying an abstract thing, something, but something that they can experience in their everyday engagements and activities. So I think people need to know what the outcome is for, for what, from what they are doing, and they have to see also certain benefit. I don't mean in, in form of money, but another benefit of uh, recognition and engagement. And for that, I think we need also to change um, a little bit the, the the science system science is organized in disciplines and the major uh, driving force is to get recognition as scientists in a specific field they want to become authorities in in their knowledge in their field of knowledge but i think for scientists to engage and to be hear, heard by, by local activists and local population, scientists need much more also authenticity. They need to be authentic, that people can believe what they are saying by the way they are seeing how they can see how the scientists themselves are doing things and not living a, a life that's completely different from what they are preaching to others. They have to engage themselves, their lives, in that kind of, of living. So I think we need to mobilize people, young people in a sustained way. We need to convince them and we can only convince them by the fact that we are models on one side, but also that they get recognition for what they are doing and that can see the benefits for themselves if they are engaging. This is actually a fresh insight, Beno. And um, listening to you, one gets immediately the idea that you, you are optimistic also, just like Nadia and Gareth before you. And you believe in the youth. Of you course, the not only the youth, I believe in everyone. <laughs> because what we've heard around the world is the pessimism of a world coming to an end of things not happening. But listening to this session and the panelists, you bring fresh air, you bring in freedom and the transdisciplinary moment where authentic lifestyle is an ethical question. And I'm going to go now to Cyril, who has already used the UN SDGs and brought it to values. It is about ethics, I think. And Cyril, in your previous um, statement, you tried to show that values-based approach was key. Will you key in with your own insights um, on this topic into what um, the colleagues before you have said, Cyril? Yes, certainly, thank you. I, I would perhaps try to give an example from my organizational work of how we in the conference of UNGOs try to listen to the voice of youth. Uh, I should perhaps explain that the conference of UNNGOs has about 40 different working groups that deal with every topic on the UN agenda virtually. Financing for development, indigenous peoples, education, status of women, and so on and so on. Largely based in the three principal UN centers, New York, Geneva, and Vienna, together with Nairobi, of course, being the fourth. Um, and these substantive committees try to bring in the voice of civil society to the debate on the issue they're concerned with as it goes through the process. And most recently, after a gap of some years, we are in the process of resuscitating our link with the youth NGOs in these centers and around the world. Uh, both in Geneva, New York and Vienna, there will be, there are youth working groups composed of the youth NGOs representatives in those areas who are forming into a global uh, NGO youth 
a committee under Congo that will bring the voice of uh, organized youth uh, into the more strongly into the UN debate. I also draw attention, uh, as some of you know of it, of the um, uh, work of the World Future Council, which has a very strong emphasis on future generations. It speaks as the voice for future generations and awards a, gives a policy award every year for good policies that underline the, uh, uh, how the standard of living of the youth in the future can be secured uh, in sustainable ways. So there are many initiatives out there. We're not here today even inventing very much, but we need to build on what has been done uh, and make it better. Um, I just want to say in addition that um, we don't often enough use the existing knowledge. Uh, it's wonderful to invent a new approach, but there's an awful lot of knowledge out there. One of my organizations, the Union of International Associations, publishes a yearbook with 33,000 civil society bodies and intergovernmental bodies listed in it. And within that, one of the volumes is specifically devoted to putting NGOs in touch with each other on the SDGs on which they are or should be working. This is an example of knowledge out there that we really need to share and to make the best use of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cyril. And you have just like um, helped us to round up this frame of the questions. There are actually six questions for each of you. And I'm really grateful to the panelists. You've been very, very good in managing your time. We want to look on the problems CSOs and youth organizations face globally. There are risks. There are major risks. Some of the CSOs in some countries are being even banned or put under question or regulated in such a way that they cannot even perform or reach out. So I would like to start again with Gareth, if you have something to say about it, what major risks um, do you see um, for CSOs globally and what practical steps could one see for the mitigation of these risks? We do know that laws are being made by parliaments, even within the European Union right now, to undermine or to even close down those who question governments. Um, if NGOs and CSOs and youth voices are clamped down, um, there will be a big problem because governments alone cannot really fulfill the needs of society. So Gareth and Nadia, would you want to consider what major risks CSOs face today and what major mitigation moments you could consider for them? Yeah, I mean, the major risk for any CSO or any actor in this space is clearly digital technology. Um, and you look at the cyber security element, uh, particularly in the future, we're effectively monitored 24 seven. Um, so everything we do now is effectively monitored. Uh, so there are risks there. Um, but if you look at the opportunities, I believe we do have a lot of opportunities. Um, I think some of the questions that we have to face are, are we doing enough to engage the youth of today. I mean, it's very easy to stand here or to sit here and say that, yeah, we engage with the youth and we have multiple you know, organizations who are out there engaging with youth. And usually what happens, the people who engage with us are the ones who are enthusiastic about youth engagement. But that's not really what we're here to do. We're here to engage with those who are disenfranchised, those who are not engaging with us. And that's where we really face the challenge and how do we bridge that gap? From my perspective, I feel we have an opportunity through health, and um, that's the purpose of the WIS platform, is to engage people through health and well-being, because that applies to everyone. That's part of the reason why we have this platform. It's not political, it's not religious. It focuses on people's health and well-being. It's a need for everyone, particularly now after COVID. And I think that gives us an opportunity to engage minority groups and all sectors of society on a platform that generates value shares wisdom, shares knowledge, creates value, and then also you know, brings everyone into that conversation. So that's where I see the risks and the opportunities. Thank you so much. Nadia, will you want to key into that? Um, maybe what I've, I've seen um, in, in, in past experience is that the perception of NGOs are often not very well um, 
perceived, particularly by the public sector or sometimes by some private corporations. So I think that it is important that uh, CSOs uh, rethink themselves also in terms of their positioning, in terms of their narrative, and so that will ensure that they have some kind of independence and also to help them on a local level, the, I think that the, the notion of coming together and coming working as an umbrella or under an umbrella organization also that has some credibility is probably a way to get CSOs to strengthen their work, have more coordination and be focused, address prior country priorities rather than their probably strategies or objectives and really link up with the community so that they can get more credibility in terms of the work they, are, they want to do or they want to achieve. Thank you so much, Nadia. That helps us a lot because there are these major risks. What I will ask now, probably Beno and Cyril, along the same lines is, do you see any practical steps for the mitigation of these risks? You know, because uh, it is clear that globally we see what's happening around the world. I mean, one has mentioned already the internet, the entire thing about watch and monitoring. What practical steps for mitigation of CSOs do you see by nations or by organizations or even military or whatever it is around the world? Um, if Beno will answer first and Siri will come to this. I mean, just uh, come back to what uh, Garrett said. I mean, digital revolution is a radical game changer. And especially in the field of information, we have so much non-edited information available today. And before the digital revo uh, revolution, most uh, informations were edited by newspapers, by TVs or, or whatever, by uh, publishers and so on to reach a wider public. And now everybody, nearly everybody, everyone can reach um, masses of people with whatever they have to say or want to say. So I think what we need to do is to strengthen the ability of especially younger generation to become their own editors. I mean, all this uh, social media, they probably they will never control the contents uh, of, uh, of the messages that are distributed by their tools because for the simple reason they wouldn't make that much money anymore if they have to control all the information. Uh, so there will be no hope to have uh, an edited version of all kinds of informations in the future. So people have to have the ability to make distinctions between what, what could be called solid knowledge or evidence-based knowledge and also logically sound conclusions from A to B and not telling whatever people just uh, have in, in their minds. So we need to other forms of education, but also strengthening the, the potential or the possibility of judgments of informations and to, to evaluate them for themselves. So everybody, everyone for, for himself or herself. And um, that's a huge task, I think. And I have no uh, clear idea how we could achieve that, but we, can't hope that there will be a clear distinction between solid and non-solid knowledge made from uh, the, the, uh, the social medias themselves. So we need to have uh, other forms of distinctions that we are not uh, chasing uh, vile things that um, are put in the world by people that have other interests than to tell the truth. Actually, this practical suggestion you make is key and I'm sure that there will be questions. Our participants are all around writing questions. Thomas is gathering many questions. I would have asked you a question immediately. How do we allow all this direct information and where do we distinguish fake news from true news? Where do we distinguish hate speech from speeches? I mean, that would be not my question now, but I'm sure one of those in the audience will be asking this kind of question because this direct knowledge transmission this direct unedited information, which is true, which is passionate, has its multi um, various dimensions that can even cause problems, impact elections, and so on and so forth. 
but I would like to thank you and go immediately over to Cyril Ritchie on also your own perspectives about the mitigations, practical steps for mitigations of these risks which CSOs and youth groups face. Yeah, thank you, Oriana. I'm sorry I jumped the gun by already raising the shrinking space matter in my very first statement, and I, I'm very happy to come back to it now. Um, uh, a preliminary remark. In one of the background documents, uh, there was this reference to, uh, which said, Greenpeace is a government-allowed NGO because it has to be registered under the law of whatever country it's based in. I completely reject that concept. There is no such a thing as a government-allowed NGO. We are citizens' associations. We have the rights under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, under the International Covenants, and any number of other international human rights laws. As citizens, to create whatever association we want, wherever we want, whenever we want, then of course, in most countries, remember, not all, most countries you have to register to be a legal entity, but then so do corporations and so does everything else. I place a great deal of emphasis on um, cooperation with parliamentarians who are supposed, after all, to control, to initiate and control government legislation, many of whom are very unhappy about the authoritarian streak that their uh, politicians have uh, adopted in recent years, even in nominally democratic uh, countries. Um, we have to stand up and speak up for the rights we have under international humanitarian and human rights law and combat through the courts occasionally, and perhaps necessarily, uh, the laws that governments uh, are, are, are uh, putting in place these days. We also have to mobilize, as I said at the beginning, governments that are more open to and friendly to the concept of citizens' responsibilities uh, to also themselves speak up through such regional bodies, for example, as the Council of Europe and its European Convention on Human Rights, which underlines the same rights of citizens to speak for themselves, to organize for themselves, and to tell governments when governments are doing wrong. So we have, to, I repeat, all of us have to stand up and speak up for the rights that we have by virtue of being citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, I mean, I mean, that's very, very helpful what you ask. I mean, one of the panelists is a youth, actually two of them. I see Garrett Presh, you're a young, brilliant freshman. <laughs> um, what contributions, for example, um, will you envisage that young people can bring into this discussion? You are young, so speak about your experience. Yeah, and I think that's that come, yeah, look, we, we yeah, but I think it's understanding, you know, I think we have to understand everyone's perspective, you know, I think um, energy is one, is one key attribute that the youth can bring, but they also need guidance, you know, we need to bridge the gap between Cyril and Bueno and yourself, Obiora, um, I'm not saying that you are old, uh, not at all, I, 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 I welcome the comment that you made that I'm, I'm a youthful looking man, so that's, that's fair enough. Um, but I think there's a, there is opportunity here. I really do believe that the Sustainable Development Goals gives a roadmap. And if we can articulate that as a group, we can reach those minority groups that are disenchanted. I think there's a huge responsibility, as Cyril mentions, on parliaments. Um, and I think we're seeing the power of social media. If you just look at the professional footballer, Marcus Rashford, this week, he's come out, he's 22 years of age, He's been fundraising, I think, $25 million for family meals in the UK. And look at the pressure he's putting on the government in order for them to provide family meals for, family meals for disadvantaged children over the summer months. So there is youth that are stepping up there and they're taking responsibility. So, you know, there is great opportunity here. But how do we engage all these sectors? And I think we as a group here collectively and, and the audience and those listening we should be putting forward those suggestions. How do we make things happen? We take the responsibility, but also we also have to champion the individuals who come on and make those actions possible. So there's no point in saying that OBR is doing a great job, Cyril's doing a great job, Bueno's doing, Nadia, myself, we're all doing great jobs, but we don't support those individuals. We have to stand up and go shoulder to shoulder with those individuals 
and give them the credit for putting themselves above the parapet, which is courage. It takes a lot of hard work to do this sort of work. And I think everyone here will agree that, you know, at times it's a lonely position, but you do need that encouragement. And I think that's where we need to show leadership as well and, and reach out to help other people. Thank you very much, Gareth. I know, for example, a youth leader from South Africa who is part of participating in this event, Livuyu. <laughs> and I'm sure you have questions to ask, or at least to talk about lessons learned when we reach that. But Nadia, you have been also partnering with youth and what lessons, what contributions can young people bring? Uh, I think we have two great examples because if we want to change things, I think we need to get some real global movement by the, by the youth. And we've seen that with Greta Thunberg that she has been able to do it. And now COVID has come seems to be uh, you know, on hold, but we should build on those movement of youth and so that there is this all, uh, you know, uh, feeling that we are all part of one same um, agenda. And the UNSDG's ag uh, global agenda should be really be driven by the youth on all its seven SDGs. And what we are seeing now, for instance, with the Black Lives um, Matter, it is also uh, striking across the globe. What do we do out of these kind of expressions that come also from the, from the, from the community, from the society, and from the youth at the same time? Well, how can we build on this, take this opportunity and seize it and make something out of it uh, at global level to support those initiatives at local level. In which case, the empowerment of youth is key in this entire discussion. Youth being part of, not being spoken about, not being addressed, but taking, taking space and creating and being allowed also to take that space. This is where I would like Beno and probably um, Cyril to make your comments. We have eight more minutes, and then I will be handing over to Thomas so now take questions which people from all over the places want to ask and all the participants. And it will be very great um, to see. Uh, Thomas, you want to say something? It's just, may I suggest, uh, <clears throat> we have a, a, a Luvuyo Madasa in the audience and we are one panelist short. Should we ask a uh, support to please make him a panelist in this session? Because I think it'd be really nice to hear his point of view on some of these issues. Uh, great, great. So while yeah. they are getting ready, uh, while leave you and uh, whom the second judge is getting ready um, to comment, because they come really from the lead, youth leadership groups, um, Beno and Cyril, would you want to make just short comments on this entire thing? And then what lessons do we learn working with youth and how do we envisage the future? I mean, every generation is making the planet for themselves anew. <laughs> so I think the most important thing is that they feel taken serious and then they can see why it is important to engage because they cannot con count on the older generation that the planet or the living conditions will be that they will could like to have it for themselves and their children. So they have to engage now because we are all used to old <laughs> ways of living and have difficulties to, to change. So it's important that the younger generation is um, engaging in ways of living that are less harmful for, our, for ourselves and our living conditions. So they have to make it for themselves and they don't do it for somebody else. So I think that's the important point. Um, to, to make them feel taken serious and that they have their own res responsibility for their own future. Thank you so much. And Cyril, please, Richie. Unmute yourself, Cyril. Unmute. Yeah. Okay. Well, allow me to speak as an older youth. <laughs> Uh, because I hope we would all agree 
that enthusiasm and commitment are not reserved to youth. Eric Koffel, my friend, please take note. We have to find ways of using the organizations and structures and information resources that we already have to better use. We have to find ways to work across borders, not just geographical borders, but mental borders, and outside our silos, which, is, which have grown up over so many years that we each stay in, we're in our comfort zone. We have to work across that. And youth, of course, are among the most ready to work across, across borders in every sense. So I believe that empowering youth starts by helping them to know what exists, to know what it is that is already there that they can use, that they can adapt, and that they can transform for the good of all of us. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now, Livuyu, we ask you to make a statement. I mean, um, yeah, it's your turn. <laughs> Unmute yourself. Livio Madesa, we met in Cape Town last year and you fascinated us moving the agenda of youth from around the countries of Africa. One of the largest youth movements called Reimagine. Reimagine the world. Good afternoon um, to the participants. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for um, the invitation to, to make a comment. So uh, today's, today's engagement I find quite interesting because in South Africa we are celebrating or com commemorating in a day called Youth Day today, um, the 16th of June. And it is both a somber and equally inspiring day because unfortunately in our history, <clears throat> a group of young people in 1976 decided to stand up against the government oppressive regime of the apartheid government at the time. And unfortunately, for many who lost their lives on that day, the government and the institution responded with brute force. Now, I share this because the, the example speaks to, yes, we're we are sitting here today and we're discussing all these ideas around strategic and transformative leadership. But I also think it's very important for all of us, both um, the elders, the, the, the wiser um, participants on the panel, along with the participants who've tuned in to be real about what we're confronted with. Um, things haven't changed because people benefit from the systems that currently are. Things are an uphill battle because there are very many institutions who, just like the government of the time, scrambled to keep its own relevance with brute force, just like what we are seeing right now with the Black Lives Matter, the institution that is the systemic exclusion sometimes on a global perspective, a localized perspective, be it in America, be it in South Africa, and many other countries around the world, systems, institutions scramble to keep their own relevance. And if our conversation isn't about equipping not only the young people, but the people who work with young people, about how to build resilience, build an understanding, build a perspective of the journey and the road ahead, um, Ibiora speaks a, a lot around the issue of values and ethics. It is also critical that we understand that people choose the unethical and um, turn their a blind eye to the values conversations because at times it's just not to their benefit. And these are the many things that unfortunately the institutions and structures that be are incentivized to keep the status quo. So in the very many conversations we're having right now, yes, it is great to have terms like transformative leadership. Yes, it is great to facilitate youth participation. But if we're not brutal and frank and honest about what we are up against, very many people will either lose their stamina, their passion and their commitment to the journey ahead. None of this work is easy. Many of you are on this panel because you've dedicated your lives to the work at hand and still, relatively speaking, have made strides that are to the benefit, but we are all aware that there's a long journey ahead. So the conversation needs 
um, at very many times above and beyond the 12 strategies that have been put forward, needs to get to the granular conversations. We have um, perspectives, we have resourcing that's an issue. We have all these things that in these conversations that we're having need to come to the fore and start learning by doing. Um, the, the, we had earlier conversations this morning and some three weeks ago had gotten onto a platform where a lot of dynamic ideas were being shared. But if we're not adapting what we're learning from the digital space and the web-based solutions into reality, we'll continue to fall short uh, against making any meaningful change to the conversation that we're here having today. And again, this is about learning who's in the room, what is offered as per solution, and what can be done going forward. Because uh, as was the case, again, to reiterate, the class of 1976 and an institution responding to maintain its own relevance in whatever way, whether justified or not, um, it did, those things continue today. And unfortunately, as complex as the reality is for very many South Africans are talking transformation, inclusion, um, livelihoods, and everything else that we are talking about systemic change, so too institutions have evolved to keep themselves relevant in far more subtle ways that are much more difficult to point out. And these are the challenges that not only you all face as panelists, but as we as young people who come up with innovative ideas, who put forward proposal, who will do the business planning that um, very many institutions request of us, but we know that that unfortunately becomes that economic principle of creating barriers to entry. People look at those proposals, they put them aside, they pick up what they want, yet they still want the results that they are asking of us to push forward. Um, Levi, we shall not leave you to stop here. Um, of course, the things you've said now really um, engage us to think about the bigger event that the World Academy of Arts and Arts and Science is preparing with the United Nations office in Geneva. This is happening on 27 and 28 October around the celebration of 75 years of the United Nations. You've listened to Cyril and Beno and all the rest, Garrett and Nadia and Thomas, of course, at the beginning, all focusing on leadership in the 21st century. You, concrete question. You've said something very strong. Things have not changed because those who benefit from them do not want change. Rather, they keep to their own relevance and keep to the status quo. This is Libuyu speaking. So what are the youth going to do in the event of this situation? What practical steps, based on your own experiences, do you want to bring on the table? I mean, there can be revolution, there can be shooting, there can be killing. We know 1976, Sharpeville. So Sharpeville, so what is it you bring to the table as a young person, speaking for the many youth organizations you are leading within the African continent? Make it short, but come to the point. So I think the, the integration and the convergence of human beings and technology is key. There is a new wave of learning through technological iterations and moving away from the analysis or paralysis by analysis to learning and building a comfort by learning by doing. And I think the more we do to this the, in this direction and the more we channel resources to people who've put together prototypes that are about learning, doing, and impacting people at community level and feeding that information up to the various different institutions and partners that not only join these conversations, but drive this innovation, future forward and um, forward looking solutions. These are the kind of support structures that we need to put in place. So a manner of trusting the young ideas that are out there, mentorship, partnership, um, essentially facilitating more platforms of this nature. And yes, we're building towards a date in the future, and I think in, in having frank, candid, and honest conversations, there are very many things that are asked of us that by the time you're done proving that it meets the metrics that academia holds to high esteem, you're already solving for a problem that's six months old. Thank you very much. And George, would you want to key into this? Libby, I'm sure we'll be coming back to you again, and of course to the panelists. Unmute yourself if you're there, George. Oh, yeah. who, who were you calling? I was calling the second person you recommended. Oh, okay. No, I don't know that they've been upgraded to... Um, uh, 
No, I didn't recommend the second person. Okay, very good. So we have listened to Livy. We now come to the, the question and answer session. Thomas, I hand over to you. You will now be in a position okay. <clears throat> to pick the questions you've received and share them. So we have a number of questions on the QA. And please, if you have anything to say or to comment or to ask, do it now. Here's your chance. I begin with you, Cyril. There's a question from, uh, from Richard Jordan in New York, uh, who would like you to say a little bit more about Congo, uh, uh, which is an alliance of NGOs and its role as a lead actor in bringing goals to action. Would you like to say a little bit about Congo? Thomas, and before that, would you want to read one or two other questions for other persons to prepare their minds, if there are? Okay. <clears throat> I think there's also a question for Benno. Um, um, might we ask you if they wish to work on redefining their resumes or CVs from a Stasis linear piece of paper into a storytelling mechanism that will engage employers? I don't know. This is a I guess how can youth can pr promote themselves? And also, um, uh, I, I, there was also from Sarah Garcia for you, Benno, a question on bottom-up movement. What, what is the core of that? And, you know, based on your experience with the International Year of Global Understanding, which, which you uh, led. Okay, maybe we'll leave how, it at how that. Many minutes, how many minutes do you allow the responses? Um, uh, just a minute or two, yeah. Thank yeah. You. It depends a bit on the question. Some questions are a little harder to answer. Cyril, would you like to begin? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I think Richard Jordan, my good friend, must have joined a little late because, as you may remember, the first two or three minutes of my remarks were almost excessively focused on uh, Congo because it is so central uh, to the relationship with the United Nations. Uh, but I would give Richard uh, the benefit of the doubt because he himself is a stalwart there. I, I, I put so much emphasis on that at the very beginning because I, I said, and I repeat, we believe, we in civil society, we in Congo, believe in the UN probably far more enthusiastically and on the basis of values than many of the member governments do. And one of our goals through this immense network of 40 odd substantive committees around the world is to endeavor to hold government's feet to the fire so that they fulfill the promises that they make. The, the, the declarations of the UN, the conventions, the treaties, the summit statements are all wonderful. But as one of the millennium documents by the heads of government said, uh, we will spare no effort to achieve the goals. Well, we're a very long way from that. And one of Congo's roles for, uh, since 1948, when we were founded, is to persuade governments and to encourage governments to do what they say they are going to do. That's the big gap in the entire United Nations system, implementing the promises that governments make. And after all, even a convention is little more than a promise a government makes to its own citizens to perform better. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> and Benno, would you like to uh, speak about uh, uh, the bottom-up movement and how, how, how what, in, in more precise terms, what, 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 what uh, shape it should take? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> to talk about bottom-up movements, um, it's quite easy, but to organize them, it's very complicated. Um, in my experience, um, the main problem is if you have, um, for instance, bottom-up movement for global understanding, and who is putting money into something or giving support into something that has not immediate impact, as they believe if you call it global understanding, for their own place. So if you engage in something global, it becomes very complicated to, to organize support because private companies, uh, state organizations, and so on, and so on, are all stuck to the territory of their organization. So they can spend money for things that are happening in a certain place, but also with an outcome, immediate outcome in that region or that nation. 
So if you engage uh, for, for global um, purposes and global circumstances, it's very difficult to, to organize local support and um, or national support. So the point is the, the, all the examples that have been very um, positive in the International Year of Global Understanding is when the national authorities or the regional authorities are engaging themselves in, in, global, um, in a global perspective. Then they, they know they can justify to support people in the region for their um, activities. But if the decisive people don't see that, it's very complicated to organize support. So in fact, bottom-up movements need to have at the beginning um, a strong engagement and self-exploitation somehow because uh, they have to invest their time and their, their uh, capacities for something they don't know what the return will be, the immediate return. So they need to engage in a rather idealistic uh, perspective at the beginning, but if they can convince them by what they are doing, uh, local authorities, then uh, very often it, it starts to work and, and they can establish themselves uh, on a longer on a long run. So important is to mobilize people with the same intention at the beginning and to have a little bit of uh, idealistic um, uh, capital somehow to to invest your own time and capacities um, without knowing what the return will be but um, very often it's not very long to to wait for for that and the second uh, question was I'm not a specialist in in CVs how to write CVs outside the scientific world but if you're engaging in in uh, scientific or academic uh, purposes uh, very often at the moment, people are judged by criteria how much money they have to raise uh, by a third party and so on. So for that, we need, as I said before, um, we should also put focus on the authenticity of the applicant. <laughs> so it's more a question not only about how to write a CV, but how to evaluate a CV. So I would uh, recommend to, if you engage in uh, local sustainability issues that uh, authenticity is a, a very strong point, I think, for the short time uh, commitment, but also for the long run self positioning in, in the context of the political world and the scientific world and so on. So I think for both, for the bottom up and how to present uh, someone's uh, own life, have some similarity. I think authenticity is a strong point and, um, and to show how um, convinced yourself are for the purposes you are standing for. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a good point. I think there's um, employers and, and organizations look for people with leadership capacity and there are various ways of of demonstrating that and, and the best way is to be authentic and to actually do it and to show that you have done that and on whatever scale, whatever opportunity, proportionate to your opportunities. And I, I wanted to comment on the local global connection also. Uh, one one uh, opportunity we now have is digital platforms for sharing the experience that people have and the actions they take for sustainability and on other issues at the local level. <clears throat> I've just been involved in a uh, building a platform uh, at Future Earth for local governments to share sustainability actions and experiences. So uh, that it will be a self-generating platform. So it is actually driven by, from the local level. And there's all, all kinds of possibilities like that in which uh, uh, local efforts can be mo made more visible and shareable. Okay. Uh, there was a question for Luvuyu here uh, from Maria Lillian Espedilla. And uh, she's wondering how, uh, what is the kind of world, the kind of future that young people like you look forward to? 
or what is your sort of how do you picture it uh, i'll answer this on, on a more is my microphone still on yeah, it's on. yeah. okay I'll, I'll answer this on a more on a more personal basis and i think um it was it benno that was speaking to authenticity authenticity in what you do and what you represent i look forward to a future where we don't celebrate uh, how many billions people have while people still go hungry that that's never made sense to me it's never made sense to me that we as a society can f- scramble and fall all over ourselves and each other to hoard wealth while other people go hungry so i look forward to a future where um in in and as much as we talk about the importance of cvs um in order to capture what it is someone can do for a corporation or an institution i look forward to a future where people in how they impact their local community what they are doing um you know they they're greeted from one part of the street to the next because people are aware of who you are and what you're doing for people on a day-to-day basis and that becomes your marker of the impact that you're making locally and what you've got to offer to the international community i th- i find these conversations in the one sense inspiring because every time i join these conversations i'm inspired by the level of commitment each of you have shown to the work that you do the resilience in waking up every single day and continuing to work against the odds but i look forward to a day where forums like this aren't needed we should be joining each other to share the successes of the work that we're doing to share the easy access to resourcing for the work that we're doing because this is the work that matters um i think dadia was speaking to her children and us um essentially creating a context where they can come into their own and i think more of that more of more of thinking beyond ourselves i mean these conversations are happening because we have access to these platforms but every single time i join conversations like this i'm always mindful of the village that my family comes from and the teenagers and the kids that i grew up with who let alone participating on the conversation like this don't own a computer don't have access to this conversation because they don't have the infrastructure in our village back in the eastern cape in south africa so i i personally have had the benefit and privilege of traveling to very many different parts of the world but i look forward to a part of um our future where that isn't only available to a select few in society should you choose to travel and explore the world that should be readily available because we share resources it's not just left for those who we celebrate on the cover of Forbes magazine to travel freely and openly so that's the kind of future i look forward to thank and you again reiterating that that's me i don't necessarily speak for all young um people but i think the this idea of democratizing wealth and access making easily and freely available the tools that people can build sustainable sustainable livelihoods that leave communities to their own devices to essentially decide what is their de- and what does their own future look like and how does it reflect who they are and what they'd like to achieve as a people okay well that's certainly a vision of the future i'd be happy to subscribe to you. thank you and um, we have um, a comment from dr livio alteano uh, for uh, you sir uh, asking um, oh, first of all congratulating you on your commitment to human rights within the un and also the council of europe and asking uh, how can uh, we respond to government harassment and constraints on ngos and i think this is really important especially <clears throat> in the context of youth because um the reason why we want to bring experienced people and and young people together is because also to protect young people and their movements uh, as they try and engage and the harder they engage the more careful they need to be uh in in how they do then they can benefit from the experience of others who've gone through that process so what do you think can be done to protect movements now in the covid context we've seen the black lives matter demonstrations which are I believe in expressions also of discontent on a broader level and we've seen the crackdowns in some countries what can we do 
uh, what are what are the sort of your tips to stay safe and to stay operational despite these kinds of restrictions? Uh, well, thanks and thanks, Livio, for your very kind uh, remarks. I, I I have already addressed this uh, in my earlier remarks. Let me summarize two points. Um, we, it seems to me, in the NGO world, the civil society world, we are on absolutely solid ground. We are on the ground of human rights law, and we are not, I repeat, subject to authorization by governments. We are representing citizens who want to support a good cause, or obviously combat a bad cause, like trafficking or uh, so on. So uh, we are on solid ground in exercising the right to organize in whatever way we want to organize, subject to not breaking uh, laws on uh, laundering, money laundering or whatever it may be. Although we're less likely to do that than some other sectors of society. I think it's, I think it's very important that we are able to rely on some top leaders, for example, the UN Secretary General, the uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and others to constantly speak up in favor of exercising the fundamental rights that we have as citizens to organize ourselves whatever way we think is the right way to do it. Mm. And as we know, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has issued uh, a number of documents on combating shrinking civil space. And I refer everyone to those documents, as indeed has the uh, Council of Europe and the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU and many others. Uh, the uh, Human Rights Commission of, uh, for Latin America. So there's a lot of solid documentation supporting our rights out there and we need to use it and occasionally we need also to be prepared when we can, it's an expensive, expensive business, to take governments to court to defend our human rights. And there we need the support of parliamentarians and of what I could call friendly big business to help pick up some of the costs. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very important. Yeah. Making, so are you looking at the time? Yeah, we're just about, we've got eight minutes left. Would you like to wrap up, Obiora? Would you like to wrap up the session? Exactly, because um, it would be very good to look at, um, I mean, with the galaxy of the speakers and try to come to a certain conclusion. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we may not forget that this session took up the issue of focusing on civil society and youth, new strategies for transformative impact, transformative impact. And we had on the panel, great people, Thomas Reuter, who is co-moderating and um, a professor in Melbourne and a member of the World Academy of Arts and Science, like myself, who is also a fellow. We have had Gareth Presh, the founder CEO of World Health Innovation and Summit. Gareth, your contributions have been very, very helpful. You actually use that word authenticity. Livio has used it, and many others, Beno and others, have continued to use it. Authenticity is built on integrity, and integrity is about values, and that's the key word in ethics. Um, Beno Verlen, UNESCO chair, and um, whenever you spoke, you brought some smile on your face, and it's important to see people who are optimistic. Um, uh, global understanding for sustainability, our contributions have been very, very rich. Nadia Balgobin, who said she is irredeemably optimistic also, because she looks at her child and she sees the future. And that future is planted already in the seeds we have now. Senior Associate of GlobeEthics.net, the leading ethics foundation in the world with the largest digital library and publications unit that tries to make ethics integration in higher education part of key. Cyril Ricci, first vice president of Conga, I mean, you have helped today's interventions in terms of making sure that you redefine youth. Your definition of youth is enthusiasm and commitment, independent of age. And this is very key. So when we talk youth, we must not just look at 10, 20, 15 years old. We must look at the passion even 90-year-old has bring 
towards the entire discussion. Your contribution has been very, very great. And of course, Siri, um, um, with this, also um, Libuyu, who really um, highlighted the key things. Things have not changed because those who benefit from them do not want to change them. This is Libuyu speaking. And then Libuyu who says, we must learn by doing and impacting people and trusting the young to mentor them, but to partner with them. This is, we must make these words very bold and put them on cards and spread right around the world because this is now um, a youth speaking. Even the last words, I look forward to authenticity and integrity, you know? And why should you hold wealth while others go hungry? I would like to thank all of you for making today's event a great success. We have tried to look at the challenges and the strategies, but most of your contributions were not just about talking about the problems, you are talking about the solutions with new insights. And you have shown us that a world yearning for transformation and change is possible. And that even COVID and its consequences is not stopping us from the systemic changes we want to have for more trust, for more just, and for more sustainable societies. I would like, on behalf of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences, to thank all of you with my co-lead and moderator, Thomas Reuter. Um, Thomas, we have a long way to go. Don't forget, mm -hmm. these days, from 15th June till 19th June, there are activities happening. There is an agenda out there. You can be part of the many activities, which are all geared towards preparing us for the bigger event of October 27, October 28, to celebrate 75 years of the United Nations on the eve of a new world where we bring in values, bring in ethics, and make sure that no one is left behind. This is very, very important. We are privileged people, but we cannot say our privilege is only for ourselves when we don't share it with others. How do we reach out to the larger world with knowledge, with values, with sharing, with resources, and as civil society organizations put pressure. I mean, you guys were able to identify some of the problems civil societies may face, one of which is called in increased monitoring also on the social media platforms to ensure that you are caught or you are not able to impact. But of course, there's resistance and this will continue to grow. I mean, Cyril was able to show us that this is fundamental right for all who belong to the world community. We want to thank each and every one. There are many, many sessions happening today and you can see that the program is really very, very heavy. Don't give up, be part of it. We have new ways of moving out of the paralysis, of doing the analysis, but especially of also going into action. It is my distinguished privilege uh, myself, also on behalf of the organization I represent, globeethics.net in Geneva to invite you also to our own conference next week on the topic of ethics in higher education. How do we strengthen it and how do we make it work? You can find it on the website. All the best and good afternoon. It's time now for lunch for some of us here. I don't know where you are. Some are in the evening time in India. They must be already trying to go into their sleep. Thomas? Thank you, Viora, and I can only reiterate, please join the working group if you have ideas, if you have critical thoughts, if you have uh, colleagues who you think you would like to bring in, please do so. We are open for business. Okay. Thank you all for participating. The entire Thank interventions you. are recorded. You can revert to them. You can download them on your website, on your computers. And you can read what you are not participating and a big volume is coming in also from the Cadmus Journal. All the best once again. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Enjoy your afternoon, evening. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.